apropos of things. Um, other comments? All right, welcome. Thanks for coming. Um, so for the folks at home, we just tasted the roast defect kit as a group. Um, so of course, you know, it's easy enough for you at home to, to pause the video and do whatever you need to do. Um, I'd love to get some comments from people in the room about the roast defect kit. Um, <coughs> for reference, I mentioned earlier, and I had sent out an email to people who ordered the kit, that the kit wasn't as good as it usually is. We've done about 10 of these, we've done about 1,000 um, samples over the past uh, two years, and usually we're using 87, 88, 89 point coffees. A um, lot of things went wrong with getting samples that never showed up and the sample roaster breaking and traveling for the holidays, whatnot, and ended up using like an 85.5 Colombian, which is you know a nice enough coffee, but it definitely doesn't, it doesn't shine. Um, I don't necessarily want to blame the roast. I think the roast was, was decent. Um, but anyway, if you order the roast defect kit and you're not happy with it, you feel free to email me, scott at scottrayo.com. Um, I will send you a, a sample of a nicer coffee in about four to six weeks at my own expense and um, just as a, you know, to make sure that you've got the experience that you want to get. Um, so for the folks here, I'd love to know your comments about the contrast between the baked and the under and the good. Anyone want to comment? Yes? Mm -hmm. like, okay, this is key, like the big versus the good. The good was definitely more complex or full or, or more mm -hmm. balanced. I guess. Sure. Uh, but that's the only thing I could rate because I right. have a novice. Yeah, I mean, it, it's an exceptionally light roast. Uh, it's not very well developed, so it's going to lose a lot of body. Um, so you get that tea like body. Um, and, you know, it doesn't have a lot of the heavier compounds, a lot of the more caramelized things, stuff like that, that, um, you know, the darker roasts do. Darker, you know. Um, so, so, yeah, tea, tea is a very, you know, apropos thing. Um, other comments? Yeah, Elliot. The bake taste a little roasty. Yeah, so so we did we did um, twelve batches. So actually, these these are these are sort of like the call it like the most representative curves from the kit. Um, we did we did four batches of each each sample um, because there were a lot of orders for it, and um, one of the baked ones flicked just a little bit. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have extra coffee, so we blended that in. Um, but the, I think that that shows up in some of the samples. Like I had, I had two different bags of it at home, and I've tasted it like ten times. And one of the bags had a slight hint of roast that the other one didn't. So definitely, though, yeah. That yes. That bake would fly in every coffee shop I've ever been to. <laughs> 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 the the unfortunate truth, Duffy, is that uh, you know, I c okay. So before Cropster and Artisan, I mean, I would argue that ninety nine percent of roasts were baked. And I would say that because it, it would be really hard to avoid baking without having the data at your disposal. Because in order to prevent an ROR crash that causes baking, you need to be able to see it. You need to know what you're doing with the gas. You need to time things very precisely. And without the software, people were just sort of just, first of all, not necessarily sure that the ROR dropping so quickly was a bad thing. Uh, most people didn't realize that that was what causes baking coffee. Uh, I think prior to 10 years ago, I think almost everybody thought baking just meant very slow roasting. Um, and, and it's still true that, that I would say most roasts are somewhat baked. Um, it's very rare that you get something like, uh, like the, the under and the good lines are relatively straight. Um, the baked isn't as baked as previous RDKs. Like sometimes we do, like in the beginning we did it where it was like poop, poop, vertical. Um, and, and I wanted to make it so that there was more subtlety, especially over time. Like most, some people have ordered the kit numerous times and I wanted to get a little bit harder. Um, but, um, but you're right, the baked is, is like a normal, normal roast out there. Slightly Yeah. Yeah. Loses some fruit. You know, it gets a little bit of hardness. Sometimes like a little bit of straw or woody quality creeps in. You know. Other comments? And, and yeah. Good oh good. Good. I've been I've been I've been fretting about the good for like a good <laughs> week. Yeah. <laughs> it's, been, it's been it's been bugging me. <laughs> um, anybody I mean this happens all the time, but like anybody prefer the baked to the under? That's that's normal. It happens. Um, I did a I did a class once in Northern Europe where like half the room was like, oh, I like the underdeveloped one, you know, because people tend to roast extremely light there, so there's a, you know, palate adaptation to that, I would say. Um, okay, any questions on that? All right, yeah. So when you're tasting the coffee, if you're tasting these both side by side, what would you be looking for in the good versus the under or the baked? Perfect. What um, I would say that, you know, uh, without, without getting into uh, flavor notes, of course, because, like, you know, I don't know if a coffee is going to taste like raspberry or not, it depends on the coffee. Generally speaking, the good is going to be rounder, juicier, sweeter, softer. Um, the baked is going to be harder, hollow, straw, wood, less sweet. Um, it's going to, it's going to, especially as it cools, 
Like if you if you were to go over there on the break and take a taste of the baked, it would just have it would have no acidity, no sweetness, no no sparkle left. Like it would it'll be it'll be really hollow. So for instance, if you if you have the coffee hot and you're like I don't know if it's baked, like leave it, come back in a half hour, and if the acidity really dissipates and the sweetness really goes away, then you can you can be more confident it was baked. Um, and the under under is interesting because it really depends on how underdeveloped the coffee is. Like extreme underdevelopments can bring out like a lot of peanut and very weird vegetal notes, sort of like asparagusy those, those kind of uh, vegetal notes. Um, slightly underdeveloped coffee can be grassy. Like coffee that's sort of borderline might be lemony, and then, then it just becomes personal preference. Like is that developed enough or something like that? Um, it, ha it can have the tea-like quality, um, and and you know if you go extremely light, sometimes there's these funky flavors you don't really associate with coffee. Um, back back when I grew up in New York in the in the 70s and 80s, the the trend back then, like the norm, was to roast extremely light. Like the cinnamon roast was the standard, and I didn't I didn't you know drink much coffee back then. But when I tasted coffee when I when I was say in grade school or as a teenager, like some of those coffees were weird. Like they didn't taste like coffee. They were they were they were tree barky and they were they were straw and they were hay and and, and sometimes peanuts. But um, you know not like I never would have thought of coffee as sweet. You know, because because those were so extremely light, and it was I think mostly a cost savings effort because you have what, less weight loss. You know, people were people were serving you know like twelve percent weight loss coffees, things like that. You know, so. so. Yeah, the good will hold on to its sweetness and, and tanginess much longer, okay. for sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, so it's interesting. Like, I have a friend who's, who's really a fantastic green buyer, and we had a conversation about this once, and he'd always assumed that it was like a green quality thing if it held on to that sweetness or acidity. But then with time and talking about it, like, he realized that it really is, uh, it really is more of a roast issue. You know? I mean, of course, the qualities have to be there to begin with in the green, but, you know, yeah. Um, anybody who came in late in the standing, you're welcome to try to grab a chair from the cafe and steal it into here. If you wish, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, there's there's a couple in here actually, or not? <laughs> there's a couple of in here. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, this may be obvious, but the most important thing really is treat all the coffees identically. In other words, weigh your grounds, weigh your water, use the same temperature, use the same grind, like just make sure you're, you're giving them a fair trial. Um, the things we've talked about already about the qualities of baked and underdeveloped, I think you, you, know, you, can, you can look for that more consciously now. Um, and really, you could go into it with no knowledge whatsoever. Like you could go into it and just say, you know, what's the difference amongst all these cups? Like probably do it blind. You know, that's always, it's always helpful, especially the first time you taste anything. It's good to do it blind so you're not biased. Um, and just be really open-minded about what you're tasting, you know. Um, you know, be aware that this is a washed Colombian, so if you throw something on the table like a natural Ethiopian, just expect, you know, wildly different qualities, of course, in the cups. You know, it might, might be helpful if you're comparing to your own coffees if you find a similar, you know, green to, to be uh, compared to. Okay. Doesn't have to be a Colombian. No, not necessarily. I mean, I mean, if, so here, here's the thing, right, and this is really hard to, we could probably do a whole class on this, but... You know, there's, there's qualities in coffee that, that are very easy to identify as roast issues. And there's qualities that are very easy to identify as, as qualities that, you know, only some green coffee has, not all green coffee has. And if you had a Venn diagram, like those two circles, remember those? Like there'll be an intersection where there's qualities that, of course, you know, of course roasting and green have to go together to pre create anything in your cup. But there are those qualities that are definitely like a merging of the two. So for instance, if a, if a coffee tasted like blueberries, I'd put that in the green category as something that it's, it's, not, it's not common in coffees, right? It's like only some coffees have that. If a coffee is smoky or, or charred, I would definitely put that in the roast category, right? And then, and then there's qualities like, you know, generally how, how is the sweetness or acidity or, or such, like what kind of balance and stuff like that, and your body, like those go in the, in the middle category in a sense, okay? So I don't know if that helps conceptualize a little bit because, you know, you might, you might put a Kenya on the table next to those and it'll definitely have more acidity and it'll probably have more buttery, body, body and it'll have like a buttery mouthfeel to it. Um, and then, you know, it might have that blueberry quality that Kenya sometimes has. So like, you know, if you think about that Venn diagram, you could say like, ah, okay, the difference is here, this part's due to Kenya, but the, the you know, lack of sweetness in the baked coffee or something like that isn't really necessarily due to the Colombian. It's, it's you know, the roast did that. Yeah, it's good to get some your head straight. Yeah. Yeah. Could it be that the, the baked and the Mm -hmm. And then maybe the, the underdeveloped, but 
it is brighter, mm -hmm. but that was the only noticeable okay. thing that I actually... Okay. I mean, they, sh they shouldn't taste too similar. I would say that when, when an ROR crashes, you're, you're losing potential development, right? Because your, your roast momentum is, is falling off dramatically. And so you're, you're prob you've probably slowed down the transfer of heat into the bean you know, dramatically. Call it 90% or something like that if it's a hard crash. So you will lose some development, all else being equal, when you crash, when you bake. Um, in, in the case of this, and I think you, you should find a little more tang, a little more acidity in the under than in the baked one. And it should be a little bit of a harder quality in that baked one. But you know, at the same, you know, everyone's going to perceive a little differently. Yeah. And also, I mean, even let's say you had a cup that had, you know, zero Quakers, and somebody else had a cup that had three Quakers or something like that. Like they might have a, you might have a different experience. Yeah. You know, so there's going to be a little variability there. You know. All right. Any other roast defect kit comments before we move on? Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so when I get a, a consulting job, I think a lot of clients get the idea that we're just going to jump into. Um, you know, let's just fix the roast curves. Let's just work on those. And, and sometimes we can, but usually we have to go through some foundational things, make sure that the machine and the installation are working properly. And almost always there's a problem with one of these qualities. And if you don't address this first, it's, it's, you might make some good curves, you might not, but, but you might be missing out on potential that you don't know is there. So we're going to talk about all these things. They, they might seem a little boring and a lot of people kind of shrug and they're like, oh, my drum RPM is this, it's fine. But actually I've, I've worked with so many hundreds of roasters and I'd say about about a quarter to a third of them had really in inappropriate drum RPM, just as an example. Uh, gas pressure is even worse, especially in America where a lot of, a lot of municipalities have relatively low natural gas pressure. Um, so these are critical. And I, I can't tell you how many roasters I've worked with who were so shocked to find out that, they say, their drum RPM was way off and that was like the cause of half their problems. Because um, it's a little bit invisible because it happens every single batch, so they're not necessarily aware that it's, that it's a problem. Um, was there a question in the corner? Okay. Um, so, I can't prescribe to you the exact drum RPM you should have because it depends, depends on your machine. So, in other words, um, like there's a note at the bottom. Let's say you have a 15 kilo uh, UG Probot, and let's say you also have a 15 kilo Joper, like, like the common room has here. The Joper's drum is exceptionally narrow and long, and the Probot's drum is exceptionally shallow and wide. So, drum RPM is mostly determined by drum diameter. So, in that case, both machines are 15 kilo capacity, but the Joper should spin a little bit faster than the Probot should. So, so it, I, can't, I can't just prescribe and say 12 kilo, 54 RPM. It's a pretty good guess for most 12 kilo machines, but you might have one where the drum proportions are not completely average or normal. Um, so these, these are pretty good estimates. What's really interesting is that if you go significantly below or above the estimate, you get more or less the same effect. So let's say, um, let's say you had a 12 kilo machine and your RPM was 35. I would say uh, that's, that's inappropriately low. And what that's going to do is each time the drum turns, the beans are going to stick on the drum surface just a little bit too long, the ones that are touching the drum. And so that gives you more conductive heat transfer. I would say that in a drum roaster, your, your enemy is conductive heat transfer. You don't want this because it can do more surface damage to the beans and it can create more uneven development. So what's interesting is if it goes really fast, let's say that same 12 kilo is running at 70 RPM, just like in those amusement park rides where it spins really fast and you get pinned against the wall, the centrifugal force is going to pin the beans against the drum, <laughs> and they're also going to stick on the drum longer each pass. So you have the same effect. So like a lot of things in roasting, like with airflow and such, you know, being in a happy medium is the place to be. So um, there, are, there are a lot of interesting things out there. Like you might kind of assume, hey, I just bought a new Probot or Diedrich or something, therefore I'm sure my drum RPM is fine. Um, I won't name names, but there are some manufacturers who not only put out machines with what I think is the wrong RPM, but, but varying levels of RPM for the same model. So for instance, if, if a certain 12 kilo machine has 35 RPMs in some machines and 55 in another, like I've gone to these manufacturers and I've said, hey, you've got the wrong RPM. They say, no, 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 we know what we're doing. And I said, okay, then how can you justify putting out machines that have both 35 and 55 at the same capacity? And they kind of first don't want to believe it exists, then they want to act like it's not that important. Um, it's, it's always a bit of a struggle but it does happen uh, extremely often. So even if your machine's brand new, check it out. Like don't, don't call them and ask them, just, just you know, take a stopwatch, open the door, or look at the back bearing, depending on where you can, you can see it, um, and just count. You know, when, the, when the machine is off, if you put a little colored sticky paper on the edge of the drum or something like that, then you can turn it on and watch the, the little sticky paper turn, something like that. Like you can just you know, time it for one minute. It's just an investment of one minute. 
and it can it can be really enlightening because if your RPM is really low, it's almost impossible to prevent ROR's from going flat and crashing. And if your RPM is extremely high, you might get that extra conductive heat transfer, but you also might end up in a scenario where um, you know, you're using a little bit more gas to get the same effect because the extra drum RPM can increase airflow. Um, and you really don't want to use any more flame than you have to because it makes the metal a little bit hotter. So um, the last thing I'll say about the, the drum RPM is that because it affects airflow, um, sometimes if you, if you have an adjustable drum RPM, you might want to check your flame, check your airflow if you do make a drum adjustment because it might have shifted a little bit. Okay. Any questions on RPM? Yeah. So with that in mind, with the same, the same manufacturer may have different RPMs, would it be just wiser just to use like the Cyclops and the angle your gains are falling at? Um, stay within those? So, um, I mean, some machines let you do that, some don't. Uh, like, for instance, the sight glass in this machine might be in a position where you can't see anything but just beans kind of pushing each other around. Um, so that it depends, really. Um, I think, you know, I think that's, that's an option. I think that you can trust that these numbers are, are, you know, confirmed over hundreds of machines over the years. Like, they're, they're pretty, pretty spot on. Um, and, if you're, and if you're close, you're good. So, like, don't, don't sweat it. If you've got a 12 kilo probot and you're running at 51, you're fine. Right, like, it, but you know, uh, if you have an adjustable drum, you know, you can you can play around with it. I mean, it's very hard to tell if your RPM is is perfect or or really really good, because um, there won't be that much difference. But if it's if it's bad, on average over time, you'll notice possibly slightly more tipping or scorching, or at an extreme, you might you might notice some uneven roasting. But it takes it takes time and experience to kind of notice those subtle differences at different RPMs. So. You, yeah, you, have you, so I, I have a physicist friend and we did some calculations once and um, I think, I think the difference in a situation like that was like relative to optimal was like two RPM or something like that. So I'll be honest, like I don't worry about batch size too much with this. Okay. Um, if you, if your um, batch size is extremely low, you might lower your RPMs a little bit just so the beans don't ping around too much. Um, but, you know, I, I think if you're, if you're at an extremely low batch size, you might, you might do what he was saying, like you might actually try to look at the beans and try to figure out how they're rotating because there may not be a guide to, to an extremely small batch size. Okay. You know? We're usually limited anyway. I mean, I mean, in a case like this, that, that probe is in a really good spot where you could probably roast 20 or 25% capacity and get good data. Usually you can't go any lower than that without your data quality going down because the bean probe is touching too much air. So you're, you're, you're limited in some ways anyway from going too small, unless you just give it a shot roasting blindly and you know, still might come out good. You know, so. All right. So this may seem really um, <coughs> low tech, and it is, but it, it's it's reasonable and it, and it really works um, in the sense that you know first you need you need a ballpark idea of where your airflow is. Um, I can't tell you based on a manometer and based on based on air pressure reading exactly what your air pressure should read in a machine. Um, you can kind of I, I would say you know step one is do this. So you take a cigarette lighter, preferably one with a slightly larger flame. The ones with the tiny tiny flame you, you don't really see the, the bending of the flame. Um, in the middle of a roast with the gas on, reasonable batch size in, do this test. Um, and just, just take a look. And you should see the flame bend you know, 70, 80, 90 degrees towards the hole. If it sucks the flame out completely, you almost certainly have a little more airflow than is optimal. And if the flame doesn't bend towards the hole, or even if it gets pushed away, you definitely don't have enough airflow. So this to me is like step one, is just get the ballpark right. So you say, oh, OK, you know, I'm, I'm bending at 75, 80 degrees. Like that, that's pretty good. Step two, I would, I would roast a whole bunch and I would look at my environmental temperature curve and generally speaking, you want to see your ET curve peak and begin to drop a little bit somewhere around the beginning of first crack, give or take, okay? If, um, that's assuming that you're using reasonable gas settings, okay? So if, if, if you're in balance and your, your ROR's are pretty smooth and your ETs are, say, peaking like three minutes before first crack in, say, a 12 minute roast, you almost certainly have too much airflow. So what's happening is, you know, there's a balance of heat going in and heat going out. You just you just pull and heat out too fast. Likewise, if you've got a machine where your ET curve never goes down throughout your roast, um, you probably are not using enough airflow, and you're probably trapping heat, and the machine's just getting hotter and hotter, and it's it's not able to sort of balance itself out towards the end of the roast. There are exceptions, like if you're trying to roast 
extremely dark, like well into second crack or something like that, and you're just powering with an enormous amount of gas, maybe your ET won't come down, et cetera. But um, for 99% of our concerns, the, the watching the ET curve is kind of step two after you do this to kind of figure out how much airflow should I have, and then you can tweak from there. Um, OK, any questions on airflow? Yeah? Okay, so that, that depends on two things, right? It depends on whether your ET probe is in the front of the machine or the back machine. If it's in the back machine, it's going to peak a little bit earlier. So, like, if it's in the back of the machine, like most Diedrichs, most small Diedrichs have it in the back of the machine, like, you might be looking at your ET peak being, like, a minute and a half, two minutes per first crack, something like that. Um, and if it's in the front of the machine, like most machines, you, you might see the peak happen, say, like, right at first crack or maybe 30 seconds before first crack. Don't sweat over that detail too much. Just the big thing to me is if it's coming down minutes before first crack, or if it's never coming down, you've got a problem. Okay. You know, airflow is relatively forgiving. Like if you're if you're in a reasonable zone, things are going to work out fine. If you're if you're outside that zone, that's all I care about. With a, <coughs> a drum temperature probe, not an exhaust probe, right? Right. So well, okay. So I was addressing like the front and the back. Right. So the front front mm, usually I refer to as environmental temperature. The back one I usually refer to as exhaust temperature. Um, and they will look a little different even on the same roast. Yeah. So, yes. How is this relative to roasting during the the roast itself? For example, I'm roasting at a, a lower lower CFM in the beginning, and it's uh, progressively increasing towards the end of the roast. So okay. Where would that flame be relative to where I am? In the right. So. I, m that's a great question. I've never, amazingly, no one's ever asked me this before, but I'm mostly referring to the highest airflow that you're using during the roast. So let's say, um, for instance, like if you have a, a Diedrich, they, they usually recommend starting at, they have three settings, right? Like through the cooling bin, 50-50, and through the roasting drum. So maybe you start at the cooling bin like they recommend, then you go to 50-50 and then roasting drum. This would be the roasting drum setting, effectively. Um, anybody here have an IR-12? Okay. Um, any idea what year the machines are? Do you know what? 19, and you have uh, roughly? 2002. Okay, so yours, yours is actually going to be very different because Stephen Deidre came to one of my classes like five years ago and he told me that they changed the fan size nine times on the IR-12 uh, over the years, and it kept getting bigger, effectively. So your fan is going to be a lot more powerful than his is. Your fan is going to be smaller. Um, you almost certainly have to go to roasting drum, right? Now, what's interesting is that if you'd bought uh, like a 2016 Diedrich, uh the fan was big, and it didn't have, uh, if it had them, they were, they were smaller, like these heat exchange panels. Um, and so on those machines, I would never go past 50-50, actually. But your machine now, you've got the heat exchange panels, and you've got a powerful fan. You actually might need the full air because the heat, the heat exchange panels trap so much heat. So it's like, like this discussion like always end up being like, OK, exactly which year, which version do you have? Um, it's actually a little complicated now. Um, but you can't get away with the same exact airflow settings on like older ones, mid-year ones, and then the latest ones. Like they, they have to be a little different. So this makes my job really fun. <laughs> yes. Do you have a favorite machine? Yes. <laughs> Any? I can I, I would never. I, I'm not here to like promote or, or shame brands, you know. Um, but um, you know, I will. I will say this that um, well, there's no. Can't well, right. We'll, we'll get to some of that stuff. I mean, I'll say that. There's no perfect machine, that's for sure. Like, I mean, even if I were to buy a machine tomorrow, like, I don't, I don't feel 100% clear, like, oh, I definitely want that one. Um, there's definitely trade-offs. You know, there's machines with, say, more technology. Like, okay, so let's take an extreme example, like the Loring, right? The Loring has some amazing features and amazing qualities, and it's got an extraordinary amount of technology on it, which means that, no offense to Loring, but, like, you know, when you have a lot of tech on it, there's, there's more little things that can break, right. right? And the Loring has a slight limitation that you can't go below 20% gas because the Airflow and the gas go up and down in lockstep, and you can't choke the, the burner. So they, they limit you there. So, so there is a little bit of a limit, so it takes a little planning, and, and it, you, know, you can't just, you know, you don't have as much flexibility at the end of a roast if you want to lower the gas more. So you could say the lowering has some amazing qualities and then some, some downsides, and it just makes it more difficult to make a clear decision about what machine you want to use. Right? And I think, you know, so, so if you said to me, I really I like to roast extremely light, and I'm um, happy to roast pretty fast. You know, and and I, have, I have infinite budget, I'd say, by a Loring. But then if someone wants a little more body in their coffee and they roast a little darker and blah, 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 like maybe, maybe they should go for a Probot or something like that. So it's, it's not always clear cut, you know. Yeah. So um, any airflow questions before we move on? Okay, awesome. 
Um, gas pressure, simply put, um, your machine, either on the badge on the side of the machine or in some PDF that the manufacturer has, they should tell you what the recommended range of gas pressure is for your machine. And the manufacturers, you know, they don't want to make their jobs any harder than they have to. So if you're somewhere in that range but on the low end, they're going to tell you it's totally fine. And, and it, technically it's fine. But what you want for your own benefit is the top of the range. Because if you're at the top of the range, you have more power. So, you know, if you've got a, a machine where it's telling you, you know, you need a eight inches water column of gas pressure, but you only have six, you know, if it's a 12 kilo machine, maybe you're going to get away with roasting like seven kilos per batch at a certain, like, let's say 11, 12 minutes, whatever. But let's say somebody else who has eight inches water column, they might be able to get nine kilos a batch. And so they've just, they basically have, you know, 28% more machine than you do or something like that, right? So um, you want to be at the top of the range. So it's, it's worth knowing how much gas pressure you have. Some people in the room might be surprised to find that they actually have insufficient gas pressure and that's why their roasts were kind of sluggish. I can't tell you if your roasts are sluggish because of that or because your machine is underpowered, but um, it's really worth finding out how much you have and if you have the option to, to get up to the top of the range because you'll have more capacity. So, yeah. How do you know? Do you have the ability to come out and measure it? Well, um, a lot of machines come with an incoming gas pressure manometer. Some people put them on. Um, you might have to ask someone to come and measure it. Uh, what kind of machine do you have? I just ordered a SX-1 Prime. Okay, so you haven't used it yet? No, it's being built. Okay, so I mean in your case, if you <laughs> if you have max gas pressure, I've only used a handful of San Franciscans, but I'm betting that you would be able to roast about 18 pounds in about 11 and a half minutes or something like that. If you can't do that, maybe you need a little more pressure. So, yeah. Anyway. Oh yeah? Okay. Elliot's an expert on, on the San Franciscans. <laughs> Definitely defer to him. Um, okay, any other, any other gas pressure comments? It's a pretty straightforward thing. Either you've got enough or you don't, and if you don't, it's worth trying to invest in getting more. You know? Okay, so uh, there's, there's engineering and there's marketing, right? <coughs> and two companies might put out a 12 kilo machine, and I'm sure both machines' drums are large enough in capacity to hold 12 kilos of coffee. That's never a problem. But one machine might have a burner with more capacity than the other one does. So they may both be 12 kilos, but really maybe one of them could roast, let's say you, you think 12 minutes is a reasonable roast time, maybe one of them can roast 10 kilos, but one of them can only roast eight kilos in, in the same amount of time. So uh, really what the manufacturer's marketing department says is the machine's capacity is not what your concern is. What your concern is how powerful is my burner? Basically in American terms, how many BTUs per hour do you have? In European terms, how many kilojoules per hour? There's other measurement systems as well. Um, and after, after using dozens of machines, I came up with this idea that 5,000 BTUs per hour was approximately right for roasting one pound of coffee um, and then, you know, with the assumption of like a 11, 12 minute batch. And then um, years later, I read this, this paper by some Italian researchers where they, they measured all, they, me they properly measured all the heat inputs and heat outputs, even like, even, you know, heat that went up the chimney, the amount of approximate energy absorbed by the beans, calculated in weight loss, et cetera, et cetera, did a lot of complicated things and basically came out with this. So they were, you know, we were within 5% of each other in terms of uh, the estimate. So um, this, is, this is a pretty good rule. The only time this rule doesn't hold up is with machines that recirculate hot air. So if you have a Loring or one of the U.S. Roaster Corps that, that recirculate hot air or the Brombati and a bunch of others do, um, they, of course, would need less burner power relative to capacity because they're trapping some of the heat and reusing it. So any questions on that? Okay. So the point of this, though, is... Um, Let's say you have 100,000 BTUs. The point is not to tell you to roast 20 pounds a batch. The point is to say that I would never go past 20. Less than 20 is actually going to be better. Like smaller batches, you have more control. If you have a drum roast, the drum itself won't get quite as hot because the flame won't be as large, so you might get a bit of a cleaner cup. So what I'm really talking about here is just, just don't go past this. Just you know, avoid the temptation to just pack coffee into the machine because you want to get as much coffee done per hour as you can. Like, just give yourself a hard limit here where you say, I'm just never going to go past a pound for 5,000 BTUs. Yeah? Will you veer away, uh, say, if you're on a Loring or someone's using this, will you veer uh, Is that equation not useful at all? Or? Well, the thing is that, um, uh, like, the Loring has its own internal, like, the amount of recirculation it does is kind of set. But then other machines, how much you recirculate is, is up to you. So most recirculation roasters, you can say, I'm going to recirculate nothing. And then at a certain point in the roast, I'm going to recirculate. So maybe you charge and you recirculate a lot. And then as the air gets 
more polluted, essentially, um, you would decrease the amount of recirculation and maybe have zero recirculation once you get a couple minutes for a first crack because you don't want to be recirculating the smoky air once the smoke starts to develop. So th I can't come up with a formula because it depends on how much recirculation you've got. Do you still trust what the machines say? Never. No. 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 I mean, I mean, you can't because it's it's not. I'm not even. I'm not trying to pick on the manufacturers, but basically, um, you know, competitive pressure means that if if one, let's say every company puts out a 12 kilo machine, and then one manufacturer is just like, yeah, you can roast 15 kilos in ours, and then everybody else is like, shit, I, you know, no one's gonna buy our machine because they all cost the same, but theirs is 15. So then they're like, oh, we'll call ours 15 as well, or whatever. You know, you get the idea. Um, that you know, there's a slippery slope where people start exaggerating, and then everybody feels competitive pressure to exaggerate. Yeah. So. so um, just to trust that yeah, yeah, and I would say you know if you can roast um, in less than 12 minutes uh, without using 100% gas, um, that you're you're completely within within the bounds of reasonableness. I'm not saying you can't go beyond that. I'm just saying like. Like if you if you're using ninety percent gas as your highest gas setting and you're roasting a certain batch size in eleven minutes, you you are doing nothing wrong. You're definitely not using too much coffee. If you say I need hundred percent gas and it takes me thirteen and a half minutes to roast this batch, doesn't mean your coffee will taste bad, but I would say you've crossed over the line where you're gonna end up having some compromises in the results. Does that make sense? Okay. Cool. All right. So um, this is this is tricky. Uh, I don't want anybody here or at home to to take this overly seriously, okay, in the sense that machines will vary, drum quality varies, batch sizes vary, okay, these are, these are ballpark estimates. This is more like the, hey, give me a place to start, and this is a great place to start. Okay, you'll find your own place in here that's, that's working for you and your machine. Um, generally speaking, you can get away with slightly hotter charges in larger machines. Um, really tiny machines tend to have what I would call uh, very volatile thermal energy. In other words, the machines will, will when, you're, when you're cooling down between batches or when the gas is low, the machine will be dropping heat really quickly. And then likewise, when the flame is high, it'll, it'll pick up heat really quickly, whereas say like a 60 kilo probot will be really stable. This thermal energy won't change that much, you know, moment to moment, the way it would in say like a 500 gram sample roaster or something like that. So, you know, we're, we're, we're charging slightly cooler in a small machine with the expectation that the small machine is, its thermal energy is going to rise I don't want to say out of control, but but like you know, much more uh, later in a roast, and we and we want to we want to mitigate that. We want to we want to make sure we don't get too hot on it. Um, whereas with the big machine, you can just kind of count on it to be super stable, and, and you can charge a little hotter. Um, can you charge a lot hotter than this? Yeah, you totally can. Um, the reason I've chosen these is that for most machines, if we're talking about classic drum roasters, most machines these are relatively safe numbers where you're not making the drum unnecessarily hot. So my, my philosophy is get as much convection as you can, avoid conduction as much as you can. So if the drum itself is hotter, it's going to transfer heat by conduction. And that's mostly damaging to the coffee relative to convection, which is cleaner and softer in the coffee. Yes? Is that true for the beginning of the roast as well? Because I've read that conduction is much better before yellow, and convective is um, beyond that. OK, don't read the internet. Um, <laughs> no. but. Um, uh, there's absolutely no chance that conduction is ever better. That's crap. Now, the only people who I think believe that and have a reason to believe it are people who um, like the sort of heavy, roasty, tarry flavor that conduction provides. So, you know, without criticizing that, it's like if that's what you want in your coffee, fine, absolutely. So for the folks at home, sorry about that. We're now in part two of the video because my phone locked. Um, so the phone lock is off now. Hopefully everything will go smoothly for, for the rest of the session. Um, OK, so again, these are, these are estimates. Um, they're really good places to start. I don't think, this might sound surprising, I don't think charge temperature is that important uh, for, for two reasons. One is that you, you can make a lot of charge temperatures work really well for given machine and batch size. And two is that what you do before you charge is arguably more important than the actual charge. In the sense that, let's say, let's say you charged at 400 degrees, two batches in a row. Before the first batch, let's say you turned off your gas, let it drop down to 350, turned the gas back on, came up to 400 and charged, right? That's gonna give you one amount of thermal energy as you charge. 
And before the second batch, let's say that you kept the gas on between batches, the temperature in the beam probe, say, got up to, say, 450. You turn off the gas, slides down to 400, and then you charge. That second batch is going to have a much hotter drum at charge, even though they both say 400 degrees in the beam probe. OK, so the, po the point is that you know, charge temperature matters. Be consistent. Choose a reasonable charge temperature, but don't obsess over it. And worry much more about your between batch protocol and making the machine's thermal energy the same each time you roast. Okay, so I, the bad news is I think that, um, I'd be happy to be wrong about this, but I think that if you're dealing with green of different temperature, there is absolutely no formula or no shortcut to knowing how to match the development level that you want relative to warmer green. So really it's like, just don't use cold green or use green of the same temperature every time is a better way to say it. Now, I know there's times where it's like, oh, you run out of a green and then, and then the truck shows up and the green's cold off the truck and you really want to roast the coffee, I really think resist the urge to roast that coffee that day. Um, if you have to, um, if it's not too cold in your roastery, let's say it's you know 70 degrees in your roastery or something like that, but the beans are chilled. Let's say they, they're like 55 degrees Fahrenheit. Sorry for the metric folks at home. Um, one thing you could do is you could put the beans in the cooling bin, turn on the cooling fan, the convection, the forced room temperature air passing through the beans is going to penetrate the beans and warm them up much more effectively than just sitting them out. Sitting out, it's going to take days relative to like virtual minutes in the cooling bin, as long as you don't pack the cooling bin too deep. Um, that's an option, but, but really at the end of the day, it's like stabilize green temperature, use the same green temperature all the time. Anything else is a nightmare to try to fix. So, yes. to go bigger you know like sometimes like s some people may tell you like oh no just invest in a 15 kg for example right uh, because of your size of um, outlets and probably like supplying and out like doing all of that but like you know how do we make that decision because si 6 kg can make like a lot of it uh, as well but you know kay. like when yeah. is the right time so um obviously some of it depends on your budget yep. and depends on how fast you're growing mm -hmm. right but you know if you're if you're only roasting 10, 15 hours a week, you probably don't have to invest in a larger machine. If you're roasting 30 hours a week, and I think it's time for you to think about buying a machine. And I, I would never go less than double the size. I would probably triple. You know, if you have a 15 kilo, move up to a 45 or something like that. Um, because, you know, you're going to, if you keep growing, you know, you don't want to every two, two years have to buy a new machine. Um, one thing to think about is that really small batches are easy to make taste great. Okay. If you do the thing, if you look at the last slide, if you do the thing where you're trying to stuff your machine and get as much as you can out of it, you're gonna compromise quality a bit. So you're better off having a machine that's a little too big, doing like one third capacity batches or something like that, than having a machine that's too small and trying to stuff it and, and get enough efficiency out of it. So if you can afford it, just you know move a little bit earlier and a little bigger yeah. in, into the larger machine. You know? So, um, but yeah, I mean, I think you know hours per week is one way to look at it. Another way to look at it is, you know, if you can afford it and you're already roasting 20 plus hours a week, you might get the next machine mostly just because if you only have one machine, that scares me as a, as a roaster, like you're vulnerable, the machine breaks or something like that. Like, you know, having a backup is an amazing thing. And also you might find that just having capacity, good things happen. Every once in a while you get some offer from some crazy person who wants you to roast uh, like 2,000 pounds of Robusta for him every week on a toll roasting type thing. And you're, it's like something you wouldn't normally do, but if you have a massive machine, you might be like, mm, sure, okay, I could do that. You know, so sometimes it just provides opportunities, you know. So, yes? Does the density of the bean have anything to do with your charge temperature? Not really. So um, I want to I wanna poke a hole in something that uh, I think density is, it's important. But it is it is spoken of with a frequency uh, that is is way beyond its importance. In the sense that, <coughs> if you're looking at say like how much gas to use for a batch, a lot of people are like, oh, denser coffees require more gas, and that, that might be true. Okay, but bean size and moisture content can have a much bigger impact on how much gas you need. In the sense that, let's assume that we're all roasting relatively high-grown quality arabica coffee. Okay, the difference of the six, 10 coffees that you have at your warehouse right now, the difference in density amongst them is not that great. It might be like 25% from high to low, right? Whereas you might have uh, a Pacamara and a Peaberry where the Pacamara is maybe three times bigger than a Peaberry. That's gonna have a dramatic difference in uh, how much gas you need. 
And if you have a coffee with, say, 12% moisture and another coffee with 8% moisture, that's going to have a dramatic difference. So the thing with density is density matters, but the actual range of densities you use on a daily basis is probably not that great. Unless you're doing some Robustas and some Brazils and some high-grown Arabicas, then maybe you have a little bit more wide, wider range of, of densities. Okay, so that's, that's number one. Number two, I think much more important than density